Hello and welcome to Edgeless Rock. Today, I'm going to a mysterious site known as Bang Malay Temple. I say it is mysterious because I'm wearing megalithic lens and I see things from a different perspective. No one knows who built it. It looks like Angkor Wat architecture and so it is considered built during his time. Bang Malaya is known as Lotus Pond in local language. It is considered a Hindu temple, although it has Buddhist motifs. For now, credit goes to King Suryavarman II because it is believed to be a contemporary of Angkor Wat. It is also believed that Dara Indravarman I initiated the foundational work. Based on this assumption, credit is given to King Suryavarman II and is therefore believed to be a 12th century achievement. This temple is not a small project even by today's standard. At 1,025 meters long and 875 meters wide, this temple takes up 896,875 square meters or 222 acres of land. With such undertaking, how can no one inscribe anything about this temple? Since no inscription is found, there isn't any way to prove anything other than lots of intelligent guesses. A simple diagram shows that the sanctum is not exactly in the center of the entire moon. It is skewed to the west horizontally and skewed to the north vertically on the map. The size of this mode temple is comparable to three other big temples. This is what you will see if you fly in an airplane over these temples at about 7,600 feet above the land. By comparison, Beng Malie is an amazing temple. Angkor Wat, Priyakan Wat, Chao Sre Vibol Wat, are temples, I would put them together in a category based on size. The moat area is significantly less obvious compared to the other three temples. You can find articles stating it is 45 meters wide. But from Google Earth, the width of the moat is about 20 meters wide on all sides except the north side which seems to be larger and ranges between 50 to 70 meters. The third enclosure, which is the outermost enclosure, measures approximately 180 meters by 150 meters. The land area is approximately 27,000 square meters or 6.7 acres. Many impressive monuments were created within these four walls. Within the third enclosure, there are second and first enclosures. There are four gopuras on all sides and the main entrance is on the east side. The grand entrance from the east comes with a terrace structure. Upon entering from the east, there is a large cruciform structure with two libraries. One is on the north and the other is on the south. On the southeast quadrant, there is another cruciform structure. This structure in other temples is typically known as Hall of Dancers. So this must be the equivalent. The other hall is simply known as Southwest Hall. There are two smaller libraries inside the first enclosure. I wonder why there are two big libraries and two small libraries. Will it make any sense if I were to ask you to build such a magnificent structure, all in polygonal stones only, and then tell you not to leave any inscription or documentation in any shape or form? If you can imagine the former glory, this majestic temple is over the top for its time. Everybody lives in flimsy wooden house or hut that will collapse within 10 years if abandoned. But when it comes to temple, it must last a thousand years. With all the hard work put into this monument, it occupies only about 3% of the entire area. 
This moat temple has the appeal of a fort and was useful during recent wars. It was full of landmines. It was declared safe for visitors in the year 2000. This moat comes with the usual water tank which no one seems to know what it is despite it is a key feature for megalithic temples. It is about 80 meters by 80 meters in size. Within the third enclosure, there is a temple known as Kan Saeng Temple. It is known as a rest house or dharmasala. Surprisingly, this temple is mostly in good condition. This Buddhist temple is said to be constructed by the Buddhist king Jayavarman VII and is considered a later addition. A Buddhist king and a Hindu temple is what you can learn from archaeologists for now. But bear in mind that these are assumptions written in fine print. Further outside the moat to the west is a structure known as Daun Chan Temple. Interestingly, it is also known as Hospital Chapel. It reminds me of Jayatataka Bare and Nippon Temple, where there is a link to the health but the ancient knowledge is lost. There isn't much to see for now, but I wonder if people actually use this to get healings. I am thinking of healing from depression, anger, hatefulness, anxiety, and issues related to the mind and soul. A little further southwest of Daun Chan Temple is Kuk Troap Temple. It is a very small temple with nothing much to see, especially when it is in a ruined state. Kuk Troap Temple most likely has a moat as you can tell from the outline. It is an east-facing temple. To the east, there is a beret that measures approximately 180 meters long by 85 meters wide. Kuk Troap Beret seems to align to the center of Kuk Troap Temple, which I feel there is a yin and yang relationship. I presented this idea in my video on Priyakan Temple, which you can check out under the Cambodia playlist. Going back up heading north, you can see Trung Lolok Temple. It is a small structure in total ruin. You can give this a pass if you don't plan to snoop around for new discovery. To the north of Beng Malie Temple is an interesting site. It is currently known as Ancient Quarry. The reason is that they found rectangular blocks still on the bedrock. This bedrock has the appearance of a quarry because it looks like blocks of stones were removed from here. This is a typical bedrock surface which archaeologists will call it a quarry even though it is a ridiculous method to get one block of stone. If I were to continue from here to remove this block of stone, I have to heal the bottom and find a way to crack it from the bottom. My chisel has to be very long, long enough to reach close to the other side of this surface. If you look at the entire five surfaces, there is not a sign of chisel activity. It looks more like some kind of stone softening technology was used. I remember watching a video where there is a similar stone surface in Indonesia. Locals say it was done by beings with the ability to soften the stone and was shaped with hands. This stone is clearly the beginning of a work to get one block of stone out from the bedrock. You can see the outline. It has holes on one side and straight lines done by repeated scratching on three sides. This is hardly a work done with ancient chisels. This so-called quarry is part of a river. That makes the quarry theory at odds with common sense. No one in their right mind will hammer bedrock with their tools in the water. This is definitely not a dry land when King Suryavarman II was around. If the entire monument stones came from here, the quarry site will be at least 100 times bigger than this. 
There is quite a bit to cover on this temple and I will share with you in my next video other strange aspects that no one is talking about. Well, that's all for now and see you in my next video. Thank you for watching and have a wonderful day. Lei hai.